Now we're in our final day, and I'm delighted that you have invested this week in this way. I know you're all busy people, and that you have invested this week in this way is certainly commendable. And uh, I think also very right, because it is important that Christians around the world understand what Islam is about. <clears throat> um, several years ago, I was in Ethiopia. I met a young man who uh, has become a believer in Christ. His, his heritage was Islam. In fact, he is a descendant of the original Muslim community in Ethiopia. You might be aware that when Muhammad was preaching in Mecca and experiencing very much opposition, finally he arranged for 300 of his disciples to immigrate from Mecca to Ethiopia to come under the, um, the authority and the protection of King Nagash, a Christian emperor of Ethiopia and they were protected. This young man comes from that community. So he is a true blood original African Muslim. He was part of that community that immigrated to, um, to Ethiopia. Now a follower of Jesus. And I asked him, how did that happen? If you became a believer in Jesus the Messiah. Well, he says that uh, during a time of famine uh, in, his com in his region of Ethiopia, he and his wife were hungry, and um, they had a little bit of food, macaroni, for their evening meal, but it was not adequate for both of them. So they were going to go to bed hungry that night, as was true of most nights. They were hungry, not enough food. And as they were, as they were sitting down to eat, a neighbor came and knocked on the door and came in. Well, in Africa, you always welcome the person who comes into your home to sit down and join you for the meal. So they, of course, had to invite him as well to join for the meal. And, um, and so uh, now there will for sure not be enough food because there's three people eating the macaroni, not just two. And so they ate and they ate and they ate till they were all full of adequate food and still food in the bowl. So they began to think, what's going on? And they looked under the table and everywhere. And because uh, this was astonishing. And then he remembered that a Christian had told him about Jesus multiplying bread, five loaves of bread and two fish to feed 5,000. And so they concluded this was a miracle which only Jesus the Messiah could have brought about. And so for the next two years, he um, watched the Christians. He said, I did my investigation in terms of Christian praxis, was the term he used, Christian practice. And I saw that the lives of the Christians I was observing were in harmony with the life and teachings of Jesus the Messiah. And so he says, it was the miracle and the life of the Christians that finally persuaded me, two years after the miracle took place, to commit my life to Jesus the Messiah as Lord and Savior, and now a follower of Jesus, and sharing this good news very fruitfully in many areas of Ethiopia. Which takes me to our scripture reading for this morning as we begin our day together. Second Corinthians chapter three. Paul writes saying, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need like some people letters of recommendation to you or from you? Then verse two is the key. You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not in ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tables of the human hearts. Most people in Corinth never read the scriptures. They didn't have the scriptures. Any scriptures that were available were copied by hand. So the scripture that the Corinthians were reading was the lives of the Christians. You are the letter known and read by everybody. And so it was with this brother in Ethiopia. <laughs> it was sometime later he actually got a Bible and began to investigate from the scriptures. But first, before he was even interested in a Bible, 
there was this reading of the letter of the Christian lives, you see, that believers in Christ are the most fruitful and effective letter that is being read by the, um, by the people among whom we live and work, you see. A letter from heaven. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> we are letters from heaven, known and read by everybody whether you're living among Muslims or living among secularists here in Kursk, whatever the situation might be. Yeah. So let's begin with, with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your faithfulness to us, for another good night of rest, and for this morning now as we begin another day of reflecting on our theme for this week together. And we invite the Holy Spirit to be with us. And we thank you that as the Holy Spirit works within our lives, we become a letter from heaven. The scripture, as it were, that people read. And we pray that your spirit will transform our lives in such ways that as people read the letter which is our lives, they will indeed see Christ present within us. And this we pray for Jesus' sake and for his glory. Amen. <clears throat> We're looking this morning now at topic 15. Um, this is the 15th chapter section on this overall theme that we're working at these, this week, Approaches to Islam, Theological and Practical. And uh, topic 15 is uh, Sharia, meaning uh, Muslim law. And the, the uh, assignments uh, are from um, this book called um, uh, the, the Way of Christians and Muslims, chapter 12, uh, goes with this topic. And in the dialogue, it is uh, chapters uh, 11 and um, chapters 11 and, and 23 would be the two chapters you would read in the dialogue. Um, and remember that uh, whenever you read a chapter in, in The Way, uh, that uh, you are to write a one-page essay related to one of the questions at the end of the chapter. You can select the question. And uh, for those doing the course for graduate credit, when you read uh, chapters in here, you will write an essay comparing Muslim and Christian theology as it relates to the particular chapters that you're reading. <clears throat> now, we're looking at, um, at the Sharia, which is Muslim law. Sharia means the path to the watering hole, you see? Islam develops in Arabia, and uh, uh, the camels find their way, the goats find their way, the sheep find their way, led by the herdsmen, to the watering hole. So the path to the watering hole, as you begin to get on that path, they actually begin to hurry up, you see. They're in a hurry to get to that watering hole, because once you get to the watering hole, you will find life. And so that's the idea of Sharia. It, it refers to the way to the watering hole. Um, uh, and it, it's, it's, it's the idea is that as you follow this way to the watering hole, you find life when you get to the watering hole. That the Sharia is the, is the, is the way to life. To, uh, and what is life? Life is submitting every area of life to the will of God. That's what it is. And when you have the Quran, so why isn't that adequate? Well, some of the Quran is, al is allegorical. Um, some of it is very clear, some of it is less clear, and you want to submit every area of life to the total teaching of the Quran. How do you do it? And so it is that yearning, that great desire to bring every area of life under the authority and, uh, of God and his will, uh, as revealed in the Quran, that led in time to the development of the Sharia systems, which define how you should conduct yourself in every area of life. I remember some years ago, um, I was out at Columbus, Ohio, in the United States. A group of us the Christian theologians were having a day of dialogical conversation with Muslim theologians from the Midwest. And um, I asked uh, the imam of the large uh, Islamic center there in Columbus, what do you do? He said, answer the telephone. <laughs> I said, what do you mean by that? He says, all day long, people, people are calling in and asking my counsel and how they shall conduct themselves in regard to some area of life. 
uh, my, my father died. How do I divide the inheritance? How do we divide the inheritance between this, the, uh, the children of, 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 of our father? And I give them the answer. Um, I, um, I am uh, dating a girl. I wish to marry her, but I have some suspicions about her. What shall I do? So I give the answer, you see. Um, my wife is no good. I think I should divorce her. Uh, shall I divorce her or not? And if I do divorce her, how do I do? I give the answer, you see? So how can he give the answer with authority? It's because he is an expert in Sharia law. So as an expert, he has the answers to give to people as they come to him for his advice. So let's look this morning for a bit at, um, at the development of Sharia law. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, it's, uh, it's the Quran which um, describes, it gives the instruction on how we should live. Then the question is, and what would be the model of one who is really obeying the Quran fully? And the obvious answer is, it's the seal of the prophets. Muhammad is the perfect example. He is the first among Muslims. So you must emulate the way of the prophet. But how do you know how the prophet did things? You see, and here is where the Hadith system comes in. So the primary, the primary source of authority for the Sharia system is, of course, the Quran. The Quran. But then the secondary source of authority for developing the Sharia was the Hadith. Meaning the tradition. And as I said earlier, this is the history side of, um, of, the Islamic, of Islamic authority. The Quran is not history. It refers to history parabolically as parables. But the Quran itself is not history. But the Hadith, this is where you get the historical content about, related to the life of, of, of Muhammad. What they did was to interview people who had received a tradition the Hadith systems were completed 200 years after Muhammad died, at 800 uh, AD, 200 years after his death. And what they would do would be to interview, and this is, this is how they're written. Um, I met with Omar, the son of so-and-so, and he told me this Hadith, which is um, an account of something that happened to the prophet or something that he said, you see. And Momer is an honest man, trustworthy. I've checked out all the people who know him, and he's trustworthy. And Omer got this hadith from um, Abdul Qadir, let's say, for example. And the investigations concerning people that knew about Abdul Qadir say he was also an honest, trustworthy man. And Abdul Qadir got this hadith from, um, from um, let's say, Ali, you know. And so the, the, this is what they call the chain of evidence, the isnad, the isnad. The chain of evidence. And so I got it from Omar, who got it from Ali, who got it from Abdul Qadir, who got it from Jacob, who got it from, let's say, Aisha the favorite wife of the prophet. Many of the hadith come from Aisha, you see. And in my investigation, I've come to the conclusion this is a reliable hadith because the chain of evidence is a reliable chain. It's not only tracing the hadith back to an original source, but it is also attesting that each person in that chain is a trustworthy person and would have passed on the truth of what he had actually heard. That's how they were developed. And um, the most outstanding, there's a couple systems, not many, but a couple systems of, of hadith. The, the most uh, widely used is by Bukhari. And he spent years and years. He, uh, he, investigate, he investigated tens of thousands of hadith. And most of them he put aside as not being reliable at all. But the hadith system he finally came together with has 9,082 hadith, you see. And they are collect, collected into, into uh, 97 books. It's a huge volume. <laughs> it's 
and, uh, and, and, and so the Muslim scholars investigate these hadith as a secondary resource to the Quran, yet very important, uh, because uh, it is through the hadith that you learn how to emulate the way of the Prophet Muhammad. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and value your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Questions, yes. Historically, is this is similar how they created the Hammurabi law also was kind of like collected from the different people or something? Yes, well Hammurabi's law of course came much, much, much earlier, you know. And, um, and he of course was uh, a wise and effective ruler over many different peoples and did collate laws from these many different peoples. But this is quite different because this isn't looking to the laws of different people. It's not saying, well, let's examine how the Arabs did things and then, then let's see how the Persians did things and let's collate these different laws together. That's not what it is at all. The purpose of hadith, of hadith is how did Muhammad do things? He is the ideal example. So the whole center of the hadith is the way of Muhammad, his sunnah. You remember we talked about that? The purpose of the hadith is to clarify the sunnah of the prophet. And they are simply voluminous and extremely meticulous. Like I said the other day, from which you shoe you should put on first. However, the Gospels are recorded very early on after the death and resurrection of Jesus. The Hadith systems were not completed till 200 years later, you see. Um, so, so the, uh, you know, uh, the Gospels were, uh, were written within, you know, within a generation of the life and death of Jesus. Um, the Quran would be more analogous to how the Gospels came to be, because upon Muhammad's death, very quickly, the disciples of Muhammad uh, collated together the Quran, and within 20 years, it was in its current form. And uh, the Gospels, likewise, uh, upon his death and resurrection, as the church began to move outward, the early church knew we needed authoritative scripture. And so very early on, the church uh, began to, uh, gave, gave attention to getting the accounts of Jesus' life written down. Yeah. It wasn't 200 years later, yes. Uh, is above the context, is above the history and above the lives That's of the right. people. That's right. Why uh, life of the prophet would help to interpret the revelation because it's above his, uh, his life, so it shouldn't be connected. And another question, like uh, the fact that revelation is above uh, the history, uh, why does it, um, like they, they, they understand that uh, Muhammad is the best example of uh, doing the Quran because he memorized himself Quran, so uh, he's right. just a recipient. Uh, is there a hint in Quran itself that he's the best uh, follower of? Oh yes, the Quran says so. Very clearly, yeah. The Quran, the Quran makes it clear. Muhammad is the first among Muslims. He is the perfect example, the perfect example of what it means to obey the Quran. Yeah. And that people should emulate his life. This is a Quranic instruction. And it's a very good point you're making. The Quran comes from above, but the Hadith, you can say, is from below. So here's where history and revelation meet, in the person of Muhammad. That's why Hadith is so very, very important. Because the Hadith described the way in which Muhammad submitted to the law of God in perfection. So here is the historical figure. Here is the revelational figure. Revelation comes from above. Muhammad comes from below. And in the Hadith, the two meet. If you compare it to the Old Testament, it's like a Talmud. No, not yet. <laughs> it, would be more, it would be more like the Mishnah, the traditions of the rabbis. Yeah. The Talmud is like the Sharia, which I'm coming to here in a moment. Yes? Uh, can, can we point to Muslim and say, okay, you see that the revelation from God cannot be abstract from uh, humankind, from life, from context, history, because you yourself using the history, historical background to understand the 
Quran. So that's why in the Bible we have uh, narratives and history because this is the best way to understand uh, God's revelation in the context of the real human lives and so on and make that connection to the. No, I think I think that's a very a very good point to make. You know, you know, that um, in Muhammad, the, the 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 history you could say and the revelation meet. Um, um, well, that's what incarnation is about. <laughs> Incarnation is about the word becoming human, you see. And um, the witness of the Bible is that it is in Jesus that this, this, this incarnation has been definitively revealed. But there's an incarnational quality about all Scripture. Because in Scripture, God is meeting the human instrument, and the human instrument is the, is the personality, even the cultural um, um, vessel in which the revelation is communicated. That's very hard for Muslims to understand. I, uh, w when, I was, uh, when I was having a dialogue uh, some years ago with a, with a Muslim theologian, we were talking about this. And, um, and uh, uh, actually, it was Katarig himself. And, <laughs> and uh, he, was, he was talking about how the revelation is tanzil, Muhammad is just a tube through which it came, and so forth. I said, well, in biblical revelation, the personality of the writer is part of the content of Revelation. God meets us in our history, you see. Human instrumentality, the Word becomes human, supremely in Jesus. But all biblical revelation has that incarnational quality to it. I said, Paul writes like Paul, and Peter writes like Peter. And Katrega's rejoinder was, oh, everybody, I hope you heard, Shank has openly confessed for all to hear that the Bible is corrupted. <laughs> Thanks be to God, the Quran has nothing to do with the personality of Muhammad at all. He is only a tube, only a channel through which the revelation came, you see. But having been only a channel through which it came, nevertheless, Muhammad in his life and practice, Muslims believe, fully submitted to this revealed will. He is the perfect example. So emulate him and you'll be okay. And that's what the whole Sharia movement is about. So these are, these are the two primary sources for the formation of, um, of, um, of Sharia. Then you have another source, which is called Qiyas, which simply means analogy. analogy. If there is some area of life that one needs to get guidance on, and the Quran doesn't speak directly to that issue, um, then you make analogy. Um, well, this situation is analogical, analogical to that situation. So analogies are made. So the art of analogy was very, very important in the formation of the Sharia system. And then the fourth source, I'm looking at the four sources, the four sources which went into the formation of the Sharia system. The fourth source is Ijma, which means consensus, consensus. Got it? So right at the heart of the whole system is the Quranic revelation. Then comes the Hadith, the way Muhammad did it. Then comes the art and practice of Giyas, learning how to make analogies um, for areas which are not specifically spoken to in the Hadith or in, in the Quran. And that whole system of looking to the Quran and the Hadith and the art of Giyas comes together in the process of Ijma meaning consensus by the ulama, ulama, who are the wise men who have memorized the Quran, who have incarnated its authority within themselves, who have studied the Hadith thoroughly, all these 97 books of Hadith, they have incorporated them, and they, and they understand the art of Giyas, and so they meet together. It's not an individual enterprise. They gather together and mull over together what well, all of this means and so the Sharia system is then developed through ijma, through the process of consensus. You see how very, very paper thin it is when a Christian who doesn't even know Arabic, <laughs> like myself, <laughs> speaks with authority about what the Quran means. We must be very careful about that, you see. And this is why in my journey, I chess with Muslims over and over and over again. What does the Quran mean about what it is saying here? 
you know, that I as a Christian do not understand this process, you see, of, uh, of memorizing the Quran and uh, understanding the Hadith from beginning to end and uh, the whole process of Giyas and being able to enter into the consensual discussion of how we apply these teachings of the Quran to everyday life. It's a tremendously profound um, spiritual gift that these ulama have, which leads them to be able to work with this kind of authority. And you can't just pick up the Quran in another language and read it and say, oh, I understand what it's all saying. You must get into the essence of it through that process. And this, this, this process is called ijtihad, ijtihad. Ijtihad, I-J-T-I-H-A-D, ijtihad. This is the process, ladies and gentlemen, of, of uh, wisely pulling together all of these streams together, you see, in the, in, in, in the decision as to what directions uh, we need to go. And, and of course, went into the whole Ishtiyad system, went into the formation of, uh, of, of, of the Sharia system. Okay, we'll... Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.